there is nothing left. Any direction you walk, all you find is more destruction. Thousands of angry Somalis and heavily armed gunmen were locked in an intense battle with the Americans. We were caught in an ambush with his troops along the frontier. So it was a policy of total annihilation. Do you think they will attack you before you attack them? How many shipwrecks do you think are down there? You've been described as the, the greatest American rock band. Is that how you feel? Are you among the last people on Earth to speak this language? And if you look at the US, what are you most worried about here? traditional Yakuza turf. They run everything here, from the girls to the sex to the drugs. Do you care if the species goes extinct? Does that oh, mean yes, you think I do. You? Why do you want to kill them? Derek and Beverly took us deep into the delta to see the lions. What is it like to be charged by a lion? <laughs> is that what a mother chimp would do? No. <laughs> <laughs> Only Mama Jane. <laughs> Coney rules by fear and claims he has mystical powers, a formidable combination in the minds of the children he kidnaps. You were part of an army mm. that taught children to kill, where young girls were raped. All these people who are doing atrocities do it under Con's instruction. Including you? Yes. The most obvious thing when you look at these walls is that it's all men up there as the past directors. And you went from zero to prime minister from <laughs> in about eight years. So were you high? Were you using? Oh again? yeah, oh, I was. And that's why you fell. I was. <laughs> <laughs> but the bed would be right there in the middle. Yeah, and you'd all sleep in one bed. We'd all sleep in one bed. Happy memories. The best. What happened to a lot of the other kids that were on the streets with you? Um. Well, unfortunately, you know, a lot of my friends are either dead or in jail. What kind of soldier are you? I'm average. I'm mediocre. This is the single greatest honor that the military can bestow on its own. And it comes right from the President of the United States himself. That's pretty good for a mediocre soldier. Think how good the great soldiers are. Welcome, Lara Logan. I decided I'm not big on uh, podiums um, and I'm being constrained by anything. So um, I decided to go with the handheld mic. So it's Sunday morning in Vegas. I figured uh, you guys probably had something of an interesting last few nights. And the last thing you feel like is a long and uh, boring speech from me. So um, I wanted to, um, I always think a lot about what I'm going to say when I come to a specific event, because I want it to be both relevant to you, um, but it's also never rehearsed, I got to be honest. So, um, uh, and that is not uh, because I'm unprepared. It's just, it's actually by design because it's pretty much who I am when I sit down to do an interview, like some of the ones you've seen there. Um, I am never rehearsed, and I'm never unprepared. Neither of those things. And it's funny when I see that, that's just a, such a tiny, tiny fraction of what I've done as a journalist in the last, how many years is it now? I started when I was 17 and I'm 48 now. So that's a long, long, long time. Um, and even though, you know, people always say, sort of, they mock you if you say that you've been doing this a long time, honestly, I really have uh, been doing it a long time, long enough to see the world around me changing in ways that many of you, some of you have, but many of you haven't yet had a chance to see. And I think that's where what I do and what you do uh, come together. That's one of the reasons that you're at this conference, right? So that you can learn from the people who have been around a long time and who, uh, who have seen the world go through these cycles and who have, uh, have something really significant, actually, to hand down. 
and I don't mean that in a condescending way, handing down, handing it along, passing it along, however you want to describe it. But even at 48, I've now reached the point in my career where <laughs> I'm so horrified by what's coming out of journalism school sometimes and what passes for journalism these days that I've started to be one of those people that wants to be involved in, uh, in what is passed on. Um, because the model of great journalism hasn't ever changed, whether it was, you know, a hundred years ago in a newspaper or Walter Cronkite during the Second World War or um, a little hometown newspaper that knows how to tell a good story. It really doesn't matter. For me, I don't do my job any differently. If any of you think, okay, well, I work for this agency in, I don't know, wherever it is, say Singapore, and one day I'm gonna work for this great agency that works all over the world and everything's gonna be different. Actually, very little is going to be different when it comes down to doing your job uh, to be great at what you do. Right, so I can't, there's uh, lots of assholes in journalism and there's lots of shitty journalism, right? Let's face it, you don't have to look very far to find that. Then there's a lot of stuff uh, online that passes for journalism today that I'm not even really sure what to call it. Not that all of it is bad, it's just that uh, I'm not, I don't really know what it is because it's hard to identify. What do I mean by that? Well, where you work, how much does an, an ad campaign and the brilliance of it matter, and how much does the algorithm matter? That's a real question, by the way. Can anyone answer that question for me? I'm just curious, because you can kill yourselves night after night working and trying to create the best work that you can, and someone else can write an algorithm, and your commercial can never see the light of day. And it doesn't matter how brilliant it is. So uh, when I look at the world today, the one that I find particularly challenging is not really different to the one that's challenging all of you, right? Because what is advertising really supposed to be about? Well, many of you rely heavily on the media. And I know that because McCann asked me to speak at their conference and they spent several years doing, as many of you probably know, a worldwide research program. And their last research program was more significant than ever because the world that they were relying on from the media was nothing like the world that they found when they actually got off their butts and went to places and talked to real people. The world in America, for example, is not just defined by Hollywood and the East Coast media. It's not. You might think it is, and in some respects it might be, but the real world is not defined by people who sit in buildings with lots of glass and. Uh, only eat avocado toast, right? I'm sorry, but I've always hated avocados. That really had to be the fruit of the future. I just, it's everywhere in Vegas too. Everywhere I walk past someone's table, they're eating more of it, so it's green stuff. Um, I live in Texas, okay? I'm a guacamole fan, but the avo toast, no. I mean, I just wanna see how long you're gonna, if you're running, if you're an Olympic runner, how far is avocado gonna get you? If you're a jet engine, how far is ethanol going to get you? I mean, we have no meat Mondays. Well, what about no fish Fridays, right? Look at what's happening to the fish stocks. Those are the stories you don't hear about. So what you do in your work, what matters just as much as the people you read about and the people you see in the media that you follow are the people you don't see and the people you don't read about. Why do they matter? Because they got to buy those products too. Right? And so when I fail, when my profession fails at what we do, you guys fail because you're relying too much on what you read and not what you live. And I know that's an easy thing to say that, you know, who's going to pay for you? You can sit at your desk and you can research the world. You can travel anywhere, right? But you can't, uh, how are you going to get your company to fund you going to this place or to that place to do something? I can't answer that question for you. I'm more like a problem identifier than a problem solver. My favorite, uh, my favorite response whenever I get asked, well, what's going to happen in the war? Well, what's the solution in Afghanistan? Oh, no. What should I know? Do I look like a, you know, if I hadn't knew that, I'd be running for the White House, right? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be just, you know, I wouldn't be the girl that no one thought would make it there and last four and a half seconds. You know, where they were like, Barbie goes to war, sure. Except I grew up in Africa 
And when I was 14, I used to go into the bush with a pack on my back and dig into the soil next to the river. And if you dug deep enough, even though the water was still black, you knew you could drink it and you weren't going to die. And I did that for fun, right? So uh, when I get there, whether it's, um, you know, Angola, I, I'm old enough to have worked in a place called Angola in Southern Africa when, when there was a war there and uh, there were no markets with supply line from Pakistan. There was no American military coming into Medivac you if you stepped on a landmine or got shot or got into trouble, right? There wasn't. There was no safety net. I grew up without a safety net. And I guess that's something that kids and a lot of people today don't really know what that means. The internet is your safety net. Your phone is your safety net. Everywhere you go, you can communicate. I was 17 years old when I got on a plane in South Africa and got off that plane in France. There was no internet. There was no email. It was 1988, 89, something like that. And uh, there were pay phones. Pay phones where you would put your money in by the time you said, hi, mom, from Paris to Durban, South Africa. The call was pretty much over, right? And you'd spent every last bit of change that you had. I mean, I used to stare through the windows of restaurants in Paris and imagine what it would be like to be able to afford to eat in a restaurant in Paris. And I'm, you know, I'm not telling you a tale of, uh, of rags to riches kind of thing, first of all, because I'm still trying to get to the riches part. But uh, no, but I mean, honestly, um, I mean, I was a white South African, so I had enjoyed a degree of privilege in my life that most of the people in my country didn't. So it's not a woeful tale, it's just a realistic tale. When I, uh, when I lay in my chambre de bonne, which is a maid's room in Paris, and I shared my, my room was about the size of this podium, and not even that long, to be honest. And you had to close the door to get the clothes off the back. And I used to use the windowsill as my refrigerator. And my toilet in Paris in 1989 was a hole in the ground. A hole in the ground that I shared with all the other people who lived in all the other Chambre de Bonnes. Um, on the top floor of all those beautiful buildings that you see in Paris. So those are the things that along the way, along my path, have always led me. I have this inescapable thing of trying to live everyone's lives, even in that moment, in my head. And I imagine in advertising, perhaps that's something that you do a lot as well. So if I'm sitting uh, with a young girl whose family have all just burned to death in a bombing, I try and imagine what it must be like to be her in that moment. Or if I'm sitting with a, with a commanding general trying to get him to address an issue, for example, Pakistan's role in the Afghan war, I try and imagine if I were him, what would I be saying to try and avoid telling the truth? And really what it comes down to me, for me in the end is uh, I know who I am and I know what I believe in and I know what I stand for. And I can't say that every journalist does that and every journalist has to be that. But to me, if you really want to, if you want your advertising, what you create to appeal to people, can't just appeal to what we say people should be. That seems to be everywhere today, right? Um, we can't just do that. I mean, you can. Go ahead and knock yourselves out. I see it everywhere, all the time. I can't buy anything these days without having to feel guilty, right? I can't buy anything, I can't do anything without having to feel guilty. Um, and uh, so I wonder how long social guilt is going to be the basis of all advertising. Um, that's just a question. I guess it depends uh, on how long you get away with it. Where advertising and media intersect as well for me is, I'll give you uh, a great example of how little you should rely on the media these days. A lot of you probably have seen that there is an immigration crisis or not crisis in the United States, and uh, this affects the southwest border of America. And you might be thinking, well, I'm from Sydney, Australia. I'm from India. What do I care about what happens on the southwest border of the United States? Well, what you're looking at when you see briefly on the international news going by or on the local news is the largest form of modern slavery anywhere on the planet. 
That's what you're actually looking at. Because there's not a person who crosses that border who doesn't owe money to a cartel in Mexico. Not one. And if they don't owe money, that's because they already owe their life. So what do you think the most powerful criminal organizations in the world do with all of those people? You all want to go to New York, right? Everybody wants to go to New York. Some of you probably live there. Those people washing your dishes when you go to your favorite restaurant, those people cleaning the buildings overnight, those people when you're walking in Brooklyn or in the streets of New York and you pass a place that says day spa and you take one look at it, you're never going into that spa, are you? Who do you think is? Who do you think is actually working in that spa? Well, there is a place in Mexico called Tenancingo, and it's a city in a state built entirely on sex trafficking. That's what it's built on, generations. Children in Tenancingo grow up dreaming of being pimps. That's what they want to be for their life. That's what they're aspiring to be. Not because they're bad people. Have us got anything to do with, uh, you know, Mexicans are, you know, evil sex traffickers. Just happens to be, that's where that place is. If it was Russia or America or whatever, I'd be saying the same thing. It's just a reality. That's where journalism separates from politics, separates from activism, activism separates from law, separates from uh, advertising, and you can keep going, right? Because we're all collectors of information. So as a collector of information, I'm trying to understand what goes to the heart. When you, you could come up with a thousand products to sell something, but what's that one product that's going to go to the heart of what this is and why people would want to buy it? That's the gold, right? That's the gold campaign that you're searching for. Well, the story that I'm searching for, the golden story that I'm searching for, is the one that goes to the heart of everything. So, yes, there are people looking for a better life. Someone said to me in one editorial conversation, you know, we got into this good versus bad people, and I said, why would you want to walk into that political trap in your reporting? Why would you let politicians lay the ground for what you learn and what you don't learn? I said, does it matter if you're a good person or a bad person, if somebody more powerful than you, more ruthless, who does have the power of life and death over the people you love and your well-being, if they say, I'm going to do this to you unless you do this, or you owe me money, what happens when they stand there and uh, rape your daughter to death in front of you and then melt her body in a vat of acid and make you watch? You think that's unusual? You think that's unusual? Look at the statistics. This is the most violent year on record in Mexico. Human Rights Watch created a term called femicides specifically to address the number of women who are kidnapped and tortured and murdered and, I mean, of course, raped and sexually assaulted in Mexico, right? And this phenomenon is now spreading beyond Mexico into other countries like Honduras and, and, uh, and others in Latin America. Why? Not because these are bad people, but because the people who do, who are pushing this and controlling it, are fighting a war fueled by greed and money and power and narcotics. So, you know, we all want to go and party in New York or Sydney or wherever, and we don't think about when you, when, if you're buying drugs, where, who are you buying them from? Well, today, if you're buying them in Moscow or you're buying them in Rio de Janeiro or in Florence, Italy, or you know somewhere in Latin America or Africa or anywhere else, you're buying them from the Mexican cartels because they today have transformed into the largest global criminal organizations that we've ever seen. They control more than 90% of the global narcotics trade. The Chinese triads deliver to the cartels. The Colombian cartels deliver to the Mexican cartels. The street gangs in America that reach into every city in this country work as subcontractors for the cartels. The human smugglers. Do you think anything happens on the southwestern border of the United States without the cartels allowing it to happen? Then you're an idiot. That border never shuts down. The cartel operations never shut down. It's 24-7. And every bend in the river in the Rio Grande along Texas, and the southwest border is a river. Every bend in the river is a gate with a scout. They're manned day and night, day and night, day and night. 
Every state along that border is controlled by the cartels. They have politicians, they have lawyers, they have doctors, they have administrators, they have policemen, they have soldiers, they have everybody. Doesn't mean everyone's a bad person, but what would you do if you're growing up in that environment? Who would you aspire to be? The people with power? Or do you want to live in the dirt and be poor your whole life? Do you want to be slaughtered in the streets? N more than 90% of Mexico's crimes go unresolved. More than 90%. So you have criminal investigators, CIS teams, who go out every day to the scenes of these crimes and try to document them. They get murdered constantly. And that, what could be a greater testament to the human spirit than a man who gets up every day knowing what he's risking, or a woman, and goes to work and gathers that crime scene evidence and records it in the hope that justice will be done and risk their life day after day after day. Could you? Would you? So why would you not hear about this story? In the day when you're hearing about why we should not have eat meat and we should not do this and we should not have uh, plastic, I call it the race against the straw, when you, have a pla when you have a paper straw, right? The drink is just a race against the straw in the heat. Um, why would you not hear about something like this? Why would you not talk about this? Why would you not be want to know? I'll tell you what's happening inside that day spa from Tenancingo into Brooklyn and into New York and into other cities in America, but mostly that's a direct pipeline. Young girls are being trafficked from the ages of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. And when they get there, they work seven days a week in those massage parlors. They have to have sex with at least 30 men a day. Or, if you like, be raped 30 men a day, 30 times a day. And they work seven days a week. One young girl who was 12 when she was recruited. Uh, and by the way, when I say recruited, what happens is a man from Tenancingo seduces you. You're a young, poor girl from a neighboring village in Mexico. And they, uh, you know, he showers you with gifts and he's got a car and the whole family brings you in and says, oh, you're so beautiful and we would love to have you as part of our family and it's uncles and aunts and, and sisters and brothers. It's generations, entire place built on sex trafficking, entire place that's in, within that industry. And they bring these young girls in, and then after a short period of time, very often when they're pregnant, after they have a baby, they're sent to the U.S., to other places too, but mostly to the U.S., and they're, they're put to work. And one of these young girls testified for the U.N. Security Council. She said, in four years, I never had a day when I wasn't raped. I had to work seven days a week. She said, you do the math. You add it up. 30 men a day, seven days a week for four years. I was raped more than 43,200 times. 43,200 times. Do you think it's any different in Thailand or Malaysia or anywhere else? It's no difference. So why does this matter? Because when, when journalists do their jobs and they follow the facts regardless of where they go, then you have something real to rely on. And when we don't, you don't. So nobody knows today what U.S. policy in Afghanistan really looks like or what U.S. policy in Iraq or Afghanistan really looks like. We don't know. We've stopped bothering about Syria for the most part. We've given up on real journalism because we're obsessed with avocado toast. Seriously. We're obsessed with social media. We don't even know if a grassroots campaign on social media is a grassroots campaign or is it a campaign that a political organization wanted because it served their interest and they created it with algorithms and bots and an army of propagandists and after a time it becomes self-fulfilling and becomes a political campaign, right? We don't even know that, but do we even ask? Do we even ask? And by the way, imagine, is there anyone in this room who doesn't have high-speed internet? Just raise your hand. Okay, that's fantastic. By the way, how many people on the planet live like that? I think it's about a third. But that means two-thirds of the planet is not. Do you think in this country, in the United States, that people don't have high-speed internet? How many of you think that everyone in the U.S. has access to high-speed internet? 
Well, I can tell you, you never hear about the rural internet program. I don't even know if it's successful or not. I haven't looked specifically into the program and followed it since it was announced. But the rural internet program in America under this administration was put in place because people in this country don't all have access to high speed internet. And I know it because I live in a, a town an hour and 10 minutes from the wonderful city of Austin that everybody loves because it's so eclectic and Democrat and it's the, you know, it's seen as a, as a sea of blue in the midst of the sea of red in, in Texas, the state that should never be forgiven. So uh, I know because I'm just an hour and 10 minutes from a big city. And when we moved there, I didn't have high speed internet. And it took me months and months and months even just to get it. I got HughesNet, the rural internet system. That was, you have, a, you have a maximum amount. That was done in a day in my house. How do you apply for a job in America today without high-speed internet? How do you apply for a job anywhere? By the way, how do you apply for a visa to the United States without access to high-speed internet? Anywhere you are, anywhere in the world. You don't. The pages are one page at a time, right? You've got to fill it out on the computer, and I mean, you guys know you probably did it. So uh, why don't we read about this in the media? Why don't we see any of these stories on television? Is it, you know, it's not because I'm so different. It's just, I guess, because growing up in South Africa, I learned some fundamental principles that I believed were true of everywhere in the world. I mean, I, I, I believed in justice for all. I believed in equality for all. And uh, one man, one vote. You know, all of those things that Nelson Mandela fought for because he was, that was the person that I grew up revering and looking up to and following. And actually, you know, that was one of the things to me that made Mandela great. Said he didn't say, I'm just for those who suffered the most. He had a vision that the world was better this way. And enough people, black and white, saw that and believed in it and fought for it. Um, but the world that we live in today is not that world for me. I have less freedom to report uh, today in the United States than I did in some ways in South Africa in the old days. Because um, I'm going to be hanged, tried, and convicted on social media, right, without ever having a chance to defend myself. So are you going to be one of those people that stands by silently and lets the mob on social media rule the world? Or are you going to be one of those people who's willing to stand apart? That's a personal question, and I can't answer it for you. In fact, a student asked me once at a college, you know, what should we be caring about? When you look at the world, what should we care about? And I said, well, I couldn't imagine having to have someone else tell me what to care about. If I have to answer that question for you, I'm afraid you're a lost cause. You know, I was like, get off your ass and figure it out. Figure out who you are and what you care about. Don't ask me to give you that. Another student asked me, with all this talk of sexual harassment at CBS, like, you know, what happens if at some point in the future, you know, I go there for a job there and, uh, you know, how would you, what advice would you give me to deal with that? And I say, have you graduated yet? Like, maybe you should concentrate on being a great journalist and not worry about some job you may or may not get sometime down the road and in the future. And by the way, if you're, if you're doing that and you're working on who you are as a person, then maybe you'll have something to contribute that endures. Because I imagine that in your world, you don't just want the ad campaign that comes and goes and was a great hit and a great success, right? But you also want the one that sort of endures, that that was a remarkable campaign. That's the one that you guys talk about, right? That's the one, the thing that you aspire to be and look up to. So I don't want to take up all the time now uh, just with talking. I can, because believe me, I've got stories from every part of the planet, literally. But um, because of the way this is, and because uh, of the reason you're here, I want to give people a chance to ask questions and see if there are things that you're interested in. And if there aren't, that's fine. I'll just move on and keep going. So does anybody have a question? Is there anything you want to ask about? I have a couple. Um, who would you most like to speak to who you haven't spoken to yet? 
Well, I, you know, I kind of want to speak to everybody because I'm naturally nosy. So Has, has anyone ever... Uh, like I always wanted to talk to Osama bin Laden, although they killed him before I had the opportunity to do that. So that was a no. Um, who would I, I uh, most like to speak to? Well, that's... Uh, it's sort of an interesting question. I really don't... Uh, I don't think about it... I guess for me, all people are the same. I mean, are not the same, but are equal. You know what I mean? So I don't like long to talk to this world leader over somebody else because all people are uh, are equally interesting to me. Like right now, I really, um, I really would like. There's a few people in Mexico right now that I really am, am interested in talking to because I'm interested in. I'm always interested in understanding all sides. So. Um, I, I put aside, uh, I try to put aside my personal prejudices. Journalists who tell you, just like advertisers, I imagine, who tell you that they don't make subjective decisions and they don't have prejudices, well, that's just horseshit, right? I mean, that's, that's not true. And uh, that's not human. We all have prejudices. We all have um, our own bias. The point, actually, the way that you arrive at uh, great journalism is not that you deny your bias, not that you pretend it doesn't exist, is that you, uh, you look at it and you acknowledge it and you take refuge in the process in spite of it. In fact, if you recognize your bias, then you have the ability to try uh, to make sure that you counter it. Right? So being aware of your own bias is much more important than pretending it doesn't exist. So when I want to speak to somebody, I have to sometimes put my own bias aside. Uh, that's why I don't do talk radio or you know a, a sort of opinion show kind of journalism because for me, uh, I had no idea when I started out at a South African newspaper when I was 17 that I was going to end up being one of these people that that's raising my hand and saying, "What the fuck? Okay, you don't declare for a candidate in an election, for or against." By the way, that's not your job. Like, okay, if one thing, if you're writing on the opinion pages, by the way, why has the Washington Post gone from two opinion pages to six opinion pages in the last few years? And then everyone's standing, saying, uh, standing up saying, you know, journalism isn't about opinion. Well, which one is it, right? I mean, of course, you have a role for opinion, but what people really want from the media today, where I hear everywhere I go, and by the way, Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. Left, right, it doesn't matter. What people want to hear is they really want to understand what's the basis of everything. How can you write a great story or how can I tell the right story and how can you sell something, come up with a great campaign if you don't understand what you're selling and who you're selling it to? Now, I'm not selling anything. Why? Because I hate that all that nonsense about the media. Oh, we have to do this to sell. We have to do this for ratings. Nonsense. You know what sells? A great story that's well told. Or, how about this? Just the truth. I just want to know what's going on. When I get to the end of the day, now your lives are immersed in media, right? But not everybody's life is immersed in media. Some people are working two, three jobs. And many people in this country are working two, three jobs. The American dream is not free. It's built on hard work. And that, that you know, actually matters whether you're working in a 7-Eleven or you own the 7-Eleven. It's still hard work, and you're still working most of the time. The average vacation in America in a contract, just ask any company, is two weeks vacation a year. Okay, that's, the, that's what I started at with CBS. And I worked there you know, for 18 years. So when I start somewhere else, that's, what the, that's where they want me to start, right? And so uh, it's built on hard work. It really and truly is. And people don't always have time to immerse themselves in the world of the media and the world of the news. But what they will make time for is a great story. They will always make time for that. What they will make time for is if something dramatic or significant happened, they want to know about it. What they don't want to make time for is uh, the little boy who cried wolf and said, oh my God, the house is burning down. The world is burning down. Oh my God, this is unprecedented. If it's not unprecedented, stop saying it is. Because nobody gives a shit by the third or fourth or, let's see, 50th, 500th 
millionth time you've said it's unprecedented, right? Stop saying it because people are going to stop listening. Just like with you guys, they're going to stop buying it. You're going to stop buying those products. If you keep shoving my social conference, conscience down my throat every time I want to go buy a car, I'm just going to ignore the commercials. That's what I'm going to do. And how, you know, what guides me often is what's inherent in every human being. I try to look at, I'm not always uh, the smartest person in the room. I'm not always the most well-versed in the history. I went and met, I thought, when I got to Washington, D.C., I thought, wow, you know, all these, all these people in Washington, D.C. who have access to all these great leaders and great thinkers, and they have access to everybody, right? And they know so much, and they've got PhDs up the wall, too. And uh, I, was, I, I thought that was really impressive. And then I got there, you know, and I went to a few of these events, and I met with a few of these people, and I was like, wow you know a lot more than me about this or that. Like for example, Russia just invaded Ukraine. And I met with someone who's one of the leading world experts on Russia. And he does know an extraordinary amount about Russia. I mean, it's mind boggling. But when he got to the whole end of his whole analysis of what exactly you know, the history and the context and everything was, and what Putin was gonna do next, and I said to him, and then there's the random factor. And he said, what is that? And having spent time in Russia and in Siberia, in Chukotka, as it's called, I, I knew, I said, the random fact that Russians are fucking crazy. They're crazy. And they're going to do, in that moment, whatever the hell they want to do. And the history be damned. And the consequences be damned. And the politics be damned. And I didn't mean that in a pejorative or a negative way. Actually, these are my people, right? I love, I love crazy people. Uh, um, what I meant it as something real that I had observed and experienced and witnessed is that uh, Russians, and I always ask people everywhere I go, what is the most important thing to know about Russians or Russia or Japan or Afghanistan, whatever it happens to be? And I ask the same question over and over, sometimes just to see if I get the same answer, sometimes just to see what I learn. So. Uh, it's very helpful because what I'm always trying to do is to understand, first and foremost, is to understand. And maybe that helps when you come from a small country in Africa, you know no one really gives a shit about you. So I don't have that expectation of importance where I go, right? I just don't. I've always had an expectation of an open mind and an open heart and wanting to understand and wanting to learn. And so that's the thing I take with me. So uh, no matter who I sit down with, Right? That's the person you're getting. And you're always getting that person. Never changes. I, I believe consistency is one of those most underrated values. So I tell my husband, if I was a pain in the ass this morning, you can bet I'm going to be a pain in the ass tonight. Right? I'm always going to be a pain in the same pain in the ass. At least you know what you can count on. And that doesn't, it's not an excuse for not evolving. But it is still, uh, I do believe that if you, it's not okay to go to work and screw people over and uh, your word not mean anything, and then go home at the end of the day and look in the mirror and say, oh, but at home I'm a really, you know, in my personal relationships, I'm a different person. No, I, I, have, I have sacrificed many things in my career. I have walked away from money, I have walked away from position, I have walked away from celebrity, I have walked away from all of it. I mean, you probably walked into this room having most of you no idea who I was and who I am and the work that I've done, and I'm totally okay with that. I don't, because I don't do it for the celebrity. I've never done it for any of those reasons. That, that really doesn't, the only way that matters to me is if that gives me more freedom in what I do to keep doing the stories that I do, then that's awesome. It's kind of like if money gives you more freedom to do more things, if it gives you the freedom to give your children more than than you might have had, or give them something you wouldn't otherwise be able to, then that's the purpose of it for me. The purpose of it is not, uh, is not to feed my own ego. So in a cutthroat business, where a lot of you might be tempted to screw each other over at work, you know, that's another personal decision that you have to make. But I always know 
I always know that I did my best and, uh, and I always know you got all of me. I'm never phoning it in. Um, so that was not really strictly answering your question. <laughs> that was a long meandering way of not answering your question. But I think the most important thing that I'm trying to get you to understand is like the person I most want to talk to is the one whose name you've never heard of. And it doesn't mean that I don't want to talk to the ones. I mean, Bruno, I, I, hanging out with Bruno was, you know, I mean, Bruno's awesome. <laughs> you know, it's like, but there, there again, how many of you knew that Bruno Mars uh, was homeless for a long time in Hawaii? How many of you knew that? How many of you knew that, say, Bruno's mom and dad were part of a doo-wop band um, and that whole of his family was in it, his uncles and aunts. And that, um, that was how he grew up learning how to sing and perform. And the way he does his work today, why he's so masterful, is what he learned about the tradition of performance from those who came before him and with him, who did it to the best of their ability, even when they were working at the Waikiki Sheraton in Hawaii, where Bruno used to be in. Elvis impersonated at the age of four, right? And, uh, and as that band broke up, his family had a souvenir shop, they lost it, and uh, Bruno's parents got divorced, and they lost everything. And his sisters went to live with his mom, and he and his brother went to live with his dad. And they would uh, sometimes sleep in the back of the car. Bruno took me and showed me the buildings where they slept on the roofs of those buildings. And then eventually they ended up in an abandoned bird park in Hawaii where they would, that room you saw where he didn't want to step in there and get uh, schmutz on his goofy Gucci loafers, because uh, it was a swamp, and there were little insects, and there were a few frogs, and there was black shit everywhere, and it was nasty, let me tell you. And Bruno was like, he was standing at the doorway, he wasn't going in there to mess up his shoes, but I'd borrowed, I didn't even, I only had heels, by the way, unless I'm going into combat, I typically am wearing heels. Um, some days in Baghdad, I'd wear them just to make my security crazy. Because uh, they take one look at that and they're thinking like, how the fuck are you gonna run if the shit hits the fan? You know, but, uh, but I always gauged my footwear by where we were in the process of the war. Obviously there's a time when you're not packing heels into your, into your rucksack, right? That's, you're just not gonna need them and you need the space for something else. Um, but. That is really uh, the point, is that for me, everybody is equally important. If you're gonna help me understand better the story. So um, I'm working on the border right now and uh, going to Tenancingo, where they don't like foreigners. We can't film in the city itself, but I've got a, two uh, prostitutes, a 15-year-old and a 20-year-old, and they're pimp who are coming out of the city to talk to me. So when I sit down and talk with them, they're the most important people in the world to me. Does anybody else have a question? Yes. Since you and then you, and then I'll go to the other side. Hi, you are an inspiration uh, beyond advertising. Um, like your personality is stellar. Stellar enough to piss a lot of people <laughs> off. I'm sure. <laughs> That's true. So uh, you must have got a lot of threats. I'm sure about that. And uh, my question is, like, when you got like the worst threat of your life, maybe when your family line was, uh, a family's life was on the line, or anything uh, worse than that, uh, what went on in your head? What was the decision you made? What was that mirror talk you had with yourself that made you uh, overcome that threat? Well. Barbara, where are you? So, uh, is everyone this afternoon going to be there? Everyone here will be there this afternoon? Okay. I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, bore you and repeat the same thing, because, uh, I mean, there were many times in my life that I've been threatened, and sometimes where I'm not, I mean, so much directly threatened, it's kind of like when you, you know, I've, I've been on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan once we, we, uh, we hit a double anti-tank mine in our vehicle. And it was the days before Up Armored 
uh, vehicles in the Afghan battlefield, and so it tore the vehicle to shreds, you know, and I, uh, the guy next to me lost his legs were blown off, was one leg was blown off, and uh, the guy on the other side of me, his back was broken, and I, you know, flew through the air like a rag doll. There was about 13 of us in that vehicle, 11 in the back, 11 soldiers in the back, two in the front, and then myself and my cameraman and two other journalists, David Rhodes and uh, from uh, New York Times at the time, and uh, Carlo Montali, an Italian photographer. Um, and I can honestly tell you then, the impact of the explosion, you know, when I, when I hit the dirt, I, I knew I sort of was uh, able to have two conversations with myself at the same time. And the one was the long, slow conversation, uh, which is a consistent feature of, when, of uh, the moments in your life when you're not sure that you're, how much time you have left. Um, and uh, the other conversation, the more sort of urgent one. So in the faraway conversation, I was thinking about all those years in Angola and other places, avoiding mines, because I'd been in a village once that was cut off from the outside world for two and a half years. There were so many mines around it. And when they eventually dug, it took, it took about a year to dig one path into that village, the village of Kakonda, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Angolan conflict. I'm sure not. but the uh, UNITA rebel soldiers uh, were supported by the US and the West, and the government was supported by, backed by Cuba and Russia in the time of the Cold War. And it was so heavily mined, these people hadn't seen anyone from the outside for two and a half years. So we were on a road in, and every few feet, the vehicles would break. We were on a food convoy with the World Food Program, bringing in sacks of grain. By the way, I just have to say, stamped with uh, uh, for a gift of the USA, and uh, she's always interesting to me because everywhere I go, all over, everywhere I've ever been, all over the globe, there's been aid like that. And I've always wondered how there's the only conversation we have is about how the US screws everything up in the world, which is a valid conversation to have. But on the other side of it, I've been in so many places where the only aid coming in has been from the US and with US money and with US everything. So. Uh, I always find that's another place where I say to you, you're not well served by the media conversation because it's distorted from the reality, right? Doesn't mean the US doesn't screw things up all over the world. It just means it's not the whole story. It just means there's some other part of the story. So uh, in that particular instance, I mean, we didn't even have food. It took us eight and a half days to travel 60 kilometers to get to a village that hadn't seen people in years. So this I was thinking about uh, all those mines I dodged, because <laughs> there were many, especially on that road, but that was just one trip I spent, you know, months and months and months in Afghanistan, I mean in Angola. And uh, all that work that no one paid any attention to, and then Princess Diana went there on one trip for like two days, <laughs> and everyone across the world. And that was just instructive to me, because she was, I saw the power of how somebody like that could raise uh, an issue like that. But when I was lying there and I'd just been blown up, um, I hit with my face, so I was pretty bad. In fact, my eyes were wide open. I had blood pouring down my mouth, out of my mouth. But in my head, I was uh, very much alive. Only I could hear this voice in the distance, and it was my cameraman, Jeff, who was, to me, it was just a little voice. And then I heard someone else say to him, is she all right? And uh, Jeff said, no, I think she's dead. And I thought, fuck, I've just been blown up. I've just been buried because I had dirt in my mouth and I, all the, I felt like I was buried under a mountain of soldiers and weapons and dirt and shrapnel. And now they're going to leave me here on my own. I don't want that. So I, was, I was, uh, you know, started spluttering and speaking. And when I opened my eyes, which were really open already, but when I could see again, Jeff was this far from my face on top of me, screaming into my face. Um, and, uh, you know, then they, they dragged us to the side of the road. That's when I learned I'm not really that useful in combat because, you know, I couldn't do a whole lot um, for a while until I sort of regained consciousness. But uh, that was the point at which CBS wanted to pull us out. They said, you can't stay there. It's too dangerous. And we were like, seriously? You're kidding, right? Like, I mean, as if we didn't know that. <laughs> um, and, you know, so then we had to go rogue and disappear 
and basically just tell all the soldiers not to answer any radio calls from headquarters related to our whereabouts. That's what it takes to do your job, right? My favorite is when people say to you, well, you know, how did you as, you know, how do your stories get assigned to you? No, your stories don't get assigned to you. You have to convince someone that it's worth sending you there. And that's maybe the lesson for you about uh, going into the communities and to the places and experiencing the things that you're writing about and creating campaigns about and waxing lyrical about, right? Is maybe you have to fight to experience them in some form or another. These things are not handed to you. I don't know, people talk about the millennial generation. I'm not really sure what that is because the millennium was something that came and went in my world. But uh, do people really expect that if they go to college then they're owed a career? I don't know, or that if you get a job somewhere that somehow people owe you like the next level. Like, it just doesn't, the world doesn't work that way. And it's never worked that way. And we might try to create a fake environment in which it appears to work that way. But that's the great thing about principles is that they really, the principles really don't change, right? They just don't. And that's why uh, it's worth fighting for what makes a great news story. Because the principles of good journalism don't change. Don't report things if you don't know they're true. Don't be a voice for any asshole with an agenda. Come on. Nine former administration officials told us once again the president is an asshole. Wow. Really? That's news. That's news. So I've got all these people that were in that meeting and there's no chance that all of those people in that meeting all have the same agenda. Is there no chance of that? When you give anonymity and you allow anonymity to become a standard, not an exception in journalism, when you allow it to become a standard, you deprive the listener, the viewer, the reader of the context in which to evaluate motive. What's the greatest single guide for me as a journalist to whether someone's telling me the truth or not telling me the truth or the whole truth or why are they telling me this truth? It might be true, but why now? Why are you telling me this now? What do you hope to gain? That's one of the greatest guides. So when I'm reading a story, people always want to know today, well, how do we get just the facts? Where do we get real news from? Where do you get your news from? You got to work at it. There's no simple easy button. You got to work at it. You've got to, I mean, you've got to see where a story is saying, this happened, this happened, this happened. Well, you got to think critically. Did, like, the way they've written it, they make it sound like fact. But then in the 19th paragraph, they say, you know, this is according to five officials who have been granted anonymity on the basis of it's going to fuck up their career. I'm sorry. On a daily basis, that's just not justification for doing that. It's just not. Why? Because it's kind of like when you, when you're, when you, if you routinely pay for stories, right? If you're paying people, they may just need the money and they may be telling you the truth. But someone else then has the opportunity to say, well, you paid them to tell you that. So the principle is that you don't pay people to talk to you, right? Yeah, you pay their expenses, you get them there. You know, there are costs along the way because people, the reality of their lives is that they're not just going to drop everything and come to you and most of them probably can't afford to. But there is, but that's not the same thing as paying someone a talent fee. In entertainment television, as you watch the merging of the unscripted world, right? Where are those lines in entertainment? I don't know where they are. In entertainment television, everybody's paid a talent fee. So at which point does that become conveniently or inconveniently corrupted? It's, um, and it's the same with social media. At which point is this really freedom of information and freedom of thought? Or at which point is this anonymity and voice that we're giving to propaganda? Somebody, a wise old man, specialist in genocide, and a rather unusual Catholic priest said to me once, uh, ISIS are the Nazis with GoPros. ISIS are the Nazis with GoPros. What does that mean? 
It's a really interesting thing. And this from a man who has documented thousands and thousands of eyewitness testimonies of killings by the Nazis in Eastern Europe and also killings by ISIS all across the Middle East, a subject we don't hear about today. We've been quick to forget. And yet ISIS still lives there. Those, a lot of those girls who are taken as sex slaves by them, they're still being raped every day. So uh, I know you had a question that I wanted to get to, and I see uh, people mustering at the back. So I know I'm up, my time is almost up, or probably up. Um, I was wondering what you think is the main difference or differences, or maybe not at all, between um, the use of empathy in the media and then the use of empathy in advertising. So I love that, uh, even the way you say that, the use of empathy in media. That is, that's a problem. <laughs> that's already a problem. And it's become the standard. And that's another problem. Because with the truth, you don't, you don't need to use the truth if you're just telling the truth, right? You only use it, you only use empathy if you have an agenda. Now, a, a great story, you could argue that a great story um, uses certain techniques, right? Like how do you tell a great story? Well, one technique is to end where you begin, the circle. When you start with the circle, the story of a little boy in this village, right? And what happened to him in his journey along the way? And where does it end with him coming back to the village? Well, there, there are techniques of storytelling, but for me, empathy is, uh, for example, not a weapon. And it shouldn't be used as one. And neither is the truth, and it shouldn't be used as one. Um, it can be, and if politicians use it that way, then there should be a distinction between what politicians are doing and what we do. And there should be a distinction between what activists do, right? Because I'll tell you this, as a journalist in South Africa, you know, my job was to cover the facts as I found them and, and to expose myself to as much as possible, to not selectively expose myself to certain truths and certain facts in order to create a false impression. It was to be as true to the whole as I could physically, humanly, possibly be. But if, for example, that meant that if I, when I was, so I was a believer in Nelson Mandela, but if I was to find that uh, Nelson Mandela, or for example, Winnie Mandela, had been murdering people in her soccer club, right, is my job then, as an activist, my job is maybe to look the other way. Because to discredit the Mandela name is to impact the greater good of the cause. I couldn't have believed in anything more than I believed in that cause. It was everything to me growing up, and still is. And, uh, but if I had found that, I would have had to report on it, because that's where the facts led me, and that was what the truth was. So activism and journalism, they don't always align. Sometimes they do, but they don't. When you're a lawyer in a court of law, your job is to free your client, right? So you're going to selectively choose from the truth and the facts and whatever you can, and maybe you don't have to. Maybe, maybe all the facts are in favor of your client, but you're trying to prove a case. As a journalist, I'm not trying to prove a case. My boss told me once, I had known for a long time that the administration of the day was lying about the return of Al-Qaeda to Afghanistan lying about coral qaeda lying about the geographic distinctions, lying about all of it. And uh, he asked me how my story was going. I was working on this story. And I said, I don't even remember what I had said to him. And he looked at me and he said, Lara, just remember, don't force it. You're not a lawyer trying to prove a case. Either it's there or it's not there. If it's true, that's enough for us. It just has to be true. And if it's, and if it's true, but you can't, get what you need to show that it's true, well then this is not the time. Then come back to it. Because sooner or later, eventually, you'll get it. And that's my hope. That's my hope that sooner or later we do get the truth. Because uh, there's a lot on a daily basis that we're getting that is only partially true, or selectively true, or some of it not true at all. Maybe a lot of it not true at all. And I would urge all of you, uh, to know who you are, 
not just the person that society says that you have to be, right? Not the one you have to be. What is the true spirit of freedom? Nelson Mandela said it in uh, Ravonia at his trial when his family begged him not to and the other leaders in the ANC cadres begged him not to say these words and he said, this is my speech, this is what I'm going to say. And he stood up there and he said that freedom is an ideal for which I would like to live, but it is an ideal for which I am quite prepared to die. And he meant it. It would have meant nothing if he wasn't prepared to die. And thank God those words gave him. That's the reason, actually, in the end, they couldn't execute him. But nobody knew that when he went on the stand and said it. So look at the price a man like that was prepared to pay. What he believed was that we have, every one of us has the capacity to be that. So his message that he taught and that was followed through every level of the ANC through generations was never diverged from that. It stayed true to that. It's an ideal for which I would like to live, but it is an ideal for which I am quite prepared to die. So what do I think when I have those really when I have those moments where everything I have and everything I am is threatened or almost taken from me, that's what I think about. I always know I, I am who I am and I gave it everything that I had and uh, that's enough because it's the best you can do. So I want it with that, I want to hand over and say thank you, and, uh, and I'll see you again this afternoon. <laughs>